ce foulard. I gave this scarf to Tenzing in 1952. I said, here you are. If you make it back to Everest, this will keep you warm. And Tenzing took it with him on the 1953 expedition with the British. But what really touched me, moved me deeply, was that as soon as he got back from his victorious Everest expedition in 1953 with the British, the first thing he did was to send me the scarf back by registered express post, saying, here's a part of you that climbed up to the summit along with me. I used to ask my mother, um, can you show me, can you introduce to me one day the man who climbed Everest? And she said, no, no, he's the man who comes to your house every morning, who wakes you up and takes you for a walk, is the Tenzing. And I said, no, 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 it could, could not be, that could not be true. I'm looking for someone. And she used to tell me that I never believed that my grandfather was the man who climbed Everest. And uh, later on, I came to know that uh, he was the Tenzing, and uh, it made me feel very proud and very, very honored to be in a member of the family. If you've ever met my grandfather, he was a great inspirational man. At the same time, he was a very, very humble um, with his great fame. <clears throat> Of course, I climbed Mount Celeb with him. From when I was a very young boy, we went to the mountains together. My father was a powerful but tolerant man. He was respectful of many things, such as new trends and opinions which differed from his own. Such tolerance allows us not to judge others, and he didn't. His motive was always to derive pleasure from being in the mountains. He didn't have a competitive spirit, and he wasn't spurred on by nationalist reasons. I've been walking in my father's footsteps for 20 years now, and I've never felt that I had to do as well as him or better than him, because I think that I'd never be able to to do as well as they did at that time. So I've never had that kind of pressure. Chomolungma, one of the Sherpa's sacred mountains, closes off the Kumbu Valley. In 1852, the British renamed it after Sir George Everest when they discovered that it was the highest peak in the world. Since the first expedition in 1921, and for the next 30 years, all attempts to climb the mythical Mount Everest set off from the Tibetan side. But in the early 1950s, when Tibet was closed off after the invasion by the Chinese Red Army, Nepal finally opened up and mountaineers discovered the south face of Mount Everest. After two reconnaissance trips by the British and the Americans, in 1950 and 51, pessimism was the order of the day. It seemed impossible to cross the Kumbu Glacier. Far from being discouraged and in fact motivated by the challenge, a group of eight Swiss mountaineers from Geneva, along with my grandfather, Shepard Tenzing, set out for the first attempt to climb Mount Everest from Nepal. The expedition began in March 1952. They were a group of inseparable friends, and they were not just mountaineers, but above all, adventurers. There was Raymond Lambert, who was a mountain guide, and his friends, René Aubert and Leon Flory, and then my grandfather, Tenzing Norgay who was to become the first man to reach the summit of Mount Everest the following year, along with Sir Edmund Hillary from New Zealand. The 
five of the members of the expedition, all Swiss, were the doctor, Gabriel Chevelli, the baby of the team, Jean-Jacques Esper, the technical expert, René Dette, Ernest Hofstetter, and Andre Rock, who filmed the expedition. On the 28th of May, 1952, Raymond Lombe and Tenzing Norge gave up at an altitude of 28,200 feet, just 650 feet from the summit of Mount Everest. I think it's mountaineering par excellence. By that I mean intrepid mountaineering for real adventurers, people who dare to go into the mountains where there is no known route, where each day they discover new ground step by step and perhaps in the end get to the summit. They certainly could have made it. I really believe that Raymond Lambert had the ability to reach the summit with Sherpa Tenzing in 52. It was a fantastic team. They achieved an amazing feat. They almost made it. There was something really incredible about what they did. They had the wisdom to say at 28,200 feet, if we go on, we won't make it back. And they did make it back. That's their greatest victory. Even I, weren't born when his father and my grandfather made it to within 650 feet of the summit of Mount Everest. But today, 50 years later, we are going to try to climb those last 650 feet. We are going to try to finish what Raymond Lambert and my grandfather dreamt of doing together. They both died several years ago. So did most of the other members of the 1952 expedition. So that the world does not forget those pioneers who opened up the route to Everest. We organized an expedition made up of a group of friends following the same route. One of the last remaining survivors of the 1952 adventure Jean-Jacques Esper is even coming with us. Along with Yves Lombe is also Stéphane Schafter, the expedition leader. The famous guide and Himalayan expert Jean Thoé. Our doctor, Philippe Avis. The photographer, Guillaume Valor. And me, Tashi Tenzing, waiting for the rest of the team in Kathmandu. Everything has developed since then. At that time, there were no roads to Kathmandu, only paths, so we came by plane. When a plane arrived, the airport guards had to chase all the cows off the landing strip so it could land. Just as we were about to land, a cow wandered back into the landing area, so the pilot had to open up the throttle and we had to circle again before being able to touch down. So from Kathmandu, we set off on foot for Everest base camp and it took us 23 days to get there. We had about four tons of equipment so we hired 180 porters who carried on average 60 pounds each. We were one of the first expeditions in Nepal so we met people who had never seen Europeans before. We were marching into the unknown and at times we asked ourselves a lot of questions. 
There wasn't a map of the region at that time, so it really was exploration. At one particular moment, we went round a kind of hill and suddenly laid out before us, we saw the spectacular panorama of Everest, with all its neighbouring mountains, Lhotse, Nupse, Tamsirku and all the rest. It was absolutely fantastic. We were so excited that we stopped and took loads of photos. We were overwhelmed with excitement and 100% motivated. It's a great pleasure to be with the team and uh, it would be nice to start walking and, and uh, keep moving here. Yeah. In 1952, uh, I think uh, the Sherpas and the Swiss had a wonderful relationship. And my grandfather always told um, that uh, he had a wonderful time with the Swiss. And this is why I think uh, adventure, uh, the journey to, this, to the summit of Everest will be very unique to our team. Well, I like Kathmandu and we had a lot of things to do, but now, after three days here, I can't wait to get walking here, the yak bells. We hope you enjoy your flight. Thank you. Hello. Your attention, please. A 10-day walk to reach the base camp. The journey takes us away from the cities, the roads, away from the creature comfort, and it changes our pace, the way we think, our feelings. We have the notebooks from the 1952 expedition with us. Raymond Lombez traveled diaries. When we read what he wrote 50 years ago, it's as if he was here with us, speaking to us. As our approach trek continues, every day will bring us closer to a purer, deeper silence. We've not yet experienced the sounds of Everest, the noise of the wind of the Serax falling, a noise which brings anguish with it and leaves a bare and absolute silence in its wake. From Kathmandu, it took us a good ten days to get here. It was the porters who decided how long we'd walk each day. On certain days there were long, difficult climbs and descents, so we covered very little distance. On other days we were in less rugged terrain, so we were able to cover a lot more ground. We stopped for a very short break at lunchtime, eating very little or even nothing at all. Of course, we had a cook, so in the evening he'd prepare us some potatoes with eggs or vegetables that he bought en route. Taking Eve to Tamil, to my grandfather Tenzing's village. Another great Sherpa was born and lives in Tamil. His name is Appa, and we are going to convince him to come with us and be a Serdar, the leader of the Sherpas. 
That was my grandfather's role on the 1952 expedition. The name Sherpa is given to Tibetans who crossed the high Himalaya to come and live in Nepal. In fact, Sherpa means people from the east. Migration began 500 years ago. Hi, Eve. This is Upper's house. Is it? Yeah. It's a nice one. Oh, yeah, nice one. Everest summit turn. Yeah. And there's Upper there. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. The famous Upper. Yeah. Hello. Hey, hey, hey. Nice to see you. Oh. Hello. 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 Nice to see you. Oh, good, good to see you. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. Okay. Good, good. Very nice lodge. Oh, thank you. Okay, please come in. Thank you. My first and foremost reason for climbing Everest is to improve the standard of living of my family and to give my children the opportunity to have a good education so that later on they won't have to risk their lives doing what I do. Secondly, I hold the world record for climbing Everest 11 times and hopefully this year I'll be able to make it 12. I know I've become famous in the mountaineering world because of this record, but at the end of the day, I'm just an ordinary Sherpa called Appa who lives here in the village of Tame. I respect all the elders of this village and they respect me. I'm not a city person. I like being here in the mountains because that's where my home is and I like a simple life. Jean-Jacques Esper has to be very careful with his heart, so he will leave us in Amchi Bazaar. It was great to have him with us. When we saw the mountain, we were absolutely stunned. We thought it was amazing that we were going to try to climb this mountain. We knew it would be extremely difficult, and it was. Ramon Lambert and Tenzing climbed to 28,220 feet, not that far from the summit. I don't know if we made a mistake in staying too long at high altitude. We stayed almost a week at 23,000 feet, which damages the body without you realizing, and then climbed to 26,250 feet. To go from 23,000 to 26,000 feet in one day almost exhausted us completely, but Everest seemed so close and we were still hopeful. However, that hope started to fade as we became more and more tired. We stayed two days and three nights at the South Coal, waiting for conditions to improve, but there was such a strong wind and the swirling snow was suffocating making it almost impossible to breathe. It really was extremely difficult because we didn't have oxygen masks. It's quite strange to see the mountain again after 50 years. Here it is, our climbing gear and food coming down out of the sky. The 180 porters of 1952 have been replaced by a Russian helicopter. Jean Thoré knows everyone in Kathmandu and knows how to fight his way through the Nepalese red tape. He was responsible for looking after 3,500 pounds of climbing gear and food, which we will be needing over the next two months. Now we've got to get all that to the base camp. The porters were lumbered with that job in 1952, but today it will be carried by the yaks. Come on, 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 come on,
Sherpas uh, are very important because religion is what rules our life. We have wonderful philosophy passed on by our great ancestors, and philosophy is mainly our being compassion and tolerance and to do good deeds to other people. Not just people, but, but any nature, the wildlife, all sorts of living creatures in, the, in this world. This is a monastery called the Tengbucha Monastery. It's nearly over 100 years old. This monastery has become the Sherpa Cultural Centre now to preserve Sherpa's heritage. In this area, in Tengbucha Monastery, we follow the Nyingmapa sect, which is the oldest sect, which was brought in Tibet in the early 6th to 7th century by a great abbot called Guru Rinpoche. So we follow his um, tantric uh, teachings, and uh, which is very, very popular in, in the great Himalayan regions of this area, and especially Tengbucha Monastery is now the heart of the, the Sherpa Cultural Center. I don't particularly believe in a god, and I, I don't want to be one of those who plays the false Buddhist just because we're in a Buddhist country. But I do believe in a force, something which follows us, which watches over us, even though I can't determine what it is or name it. I respect their religion because I think it's wonderful to be a believer. To respect their beliefs without sharing them is the best possible form of tolerance that one can have. This is, to a certain extent, the basis of Buddhism, in the sense that tolerance is, is actually taught in this country. At that time, my father was very respectful of different peoples and religions. All the expedition members were always respectful of the local populations and their religion because they weren't just mountaineers in the purely technical sense of the term, but they were also explorers. They were discovering a region where no white man had been before, so they had to have respect in the broadest sense. When I was a young girl, I came to the mountains to work as a servant in Kunjung. Later on, I went to Tame, where I fell in love with a Sherpa. We got married and had a daughter. I stayed at home to breastfeed her, but when she was weaned, I wanted to go back to work because we needed more money to look after her. My husband and I both work on treks now with our yaks, and my daughter is with my parents-in-law. I love walking in the mountains and looking after my yaks. They walk slowly at their own pace, not too fast. Life is hard here, but all in all, we're pretty happy. En route to Periche, three days walk to the base camp. Periche is well known because it's home to the only high altitude hospital in the valley. Um, this fellow came to us this morning with acute uh, pulmonary edema um, brought on by altitude. Probably a very quick 
uh, ascent uh, brought on these symptoms and last night he uh, felt very fatigued, began to feel dizzy. This morning was unable to dress himself, could not eat, and uh, had to be carried down uh, from a higher altitude uh, to here for treatment. I am checking the oxygen saturation with an infrared beam through the capillary of the finger. Uh, this tells us that the pulse rate is 84, and there is 87% hemoglobin saturation with oxygen. So the oxygen has brought his lung oxygen capability up from 50% when he felt very ill to 87%, which is very good at this altitude. Alors le mal des montagnes se différencie en plusieurs There are several stages of mountain sickness. Mild mountain sickness is characterized by headaches, loss of appetite, and getting breathless more quickly than normal. But this can lead to much more serious complications, such as acute pulmonary edema, like the case we've just seen at Periche Hospital, or even worse, cerebral edema. Edema occurs when there's a buildup of water in the lungs or brain. The main cause is the lack of oxygen, which disturbs the barrier between the air in the lungs and the blood. A doctor taking part in an expedition to Everest has to be able to practice his profession and be capable of following the team members right to the summit if possible. Mets-toi bien au fond. Bon, Yves, on va fermer. Ok, je commence à zipper. En deux temps, hein. Voilà. It's a good idea to test the portable altitude chamber when you're in good shape. It folds up, weighs 11 pounds and allows you to artificially reduce the altitude by increasing the atmospheric pressure in case of edema. A patient can be placed in conditions which simulate an altitude up to 9,800 feet lower than the actual geographical altitude. l'ensemble de la marche d'approche, ce qu'on a respecté par rapport au docteur au niveau acclimatation, donc look là, ensuite pack ding, ensuite lam chi bazar, siang boche, le sentier qu'on a emprunté hier, feng boche, pang boche, perichie, on est en ce moment, en remontant la vallée cette fois plus près de l'Everest, on arrive à l'obouche, donc on est déjà en bordure du glacier qui vient de l'Everest, on continue sur Gorachep, au-dessous du Calapatar, le point de vue panoramique de la combo est, Nupsi, Everest, puis Maurice, je dirais. Et de Gorachep, on rejoint le camp de base, donc à 5200 mètres, au pied de l'Everest, on sera installé dans trois jours. Jusqu'au camp de base, j'ai une responsabilité de chef d'expédition. I have the responsibility of expedition leader as far as base camp, as I've organized the entire project from A to Z. From base camp onwards, I need to be able to focus all my energy on filming, so I'll delegate my powers to Jean Trouillet and Appa Sherpa. This means that they'll decide where to set up the camps and which itinerary to take. That means I can wander off the main route in order to get the best shots. Unfortunately, I couldn't prepare properly this year as I've just had a parent gliding accident. However, Everest is a fairly easy mountain, technically speaking, so I can rely upon my knowledge and competence, which allows me to be fairly calm about shooting this film.
There is the summit. It hasn't changed in 50 years. It's the way we see that is different. Today, everybody's seen it, for real or in photograph. This peak towers nearly 20,000 feet above us, reaching into the stratosphere, reaching infinite heights. How can there be any doubt that it touches forbidden doorways? The